So in this video we're going to look at the concept of finding an area of a region using an iterated int uh, integral. So here's the, here's the idea. Suppose you've got a region R and you want to know the area of the region in the XY plane. And let's say that that region is bounded by some function of y, so we know x equals g sub 1 is a function of y, and a second function will say x equals g sub 2, which is a function of y. So we bound it with two functions of y, and then we run it from a to b in the y direction, and we bound it by horizontal lines. So we're looking at the area of the region between the two curves, and between the two horizontal lines. So what you want to think about is how you could approximate the area of such a region. And one way to do it would be to cut the region up into lots of little squares. And then calculate the area of each square and add up the total area. So if I pull a single square out of here, let's say I cut this entire region up into squares like this, and I pull a single square out and I look at it. Each square is going to be delta x, it's going to have a change in width, and it's going to have a delta y, a change in y. And the area of this square actually is just the base, which is a width, the change in width, times the height. And order of multiplication doesn't matter, so we could just as easily do delta y times delta x. Order of multiplication doesn't matter. So if this is the ith square that you pulled out of this region, then this will be delta y sub i. This will be the change in uh, height of the ith region, and this will be delta x sub i, the change in width of the ith region in the plane. So if we wanted to estimate the entire area of the plane, what we could do is cut it up into n squares, and then we could take the sum from i equal 1 to n, and we would either do delta x sub i times delta y sub i, add up each of the each of the n regions, so i just represents the region you're working with, running through 1 through n squares or regions in the xy plane, you would just add them all up. And the order of the addition wouldn't matter, so you could just as easily run it from i equal 1 to n and multiply delta y sub i times delta x sub i, a height times a width to get an area. And then what you would need to do is, and think back to calculus one, what you would need to do to get the exact area of the region is you need to get, you need to let the sizes of these squares become infinitely small. We need to let the delta x sub i and delta y sub i's go to zero, so that instead of a delta x sub i delta y sub i, we have a dx times a dy, so they're infinitely small squares. We need infinitely many of them, and we need the sizes of all of them to go to zero. So what you do is you define a norm for each square. You say, let, let, the, let the norm of my region be the diagonal of the largest square. So the size of the diagonal, we'll call it d of the largest square. And then what you want to do is take the limit as the size of the largest diagonal goes to zero, and if we are letting the diagonals of the square go to zero, then the number of squares will go to infinity. So, and that will give us the exact area of the region. So what you do is you take the limit on this as this norm, the length of the largest possible diagonal in this region for the squares, you let that go to zero, which means n will go to infinity. You'll fill the region with infinitely many squares, and they'll be infinitely thin, and uh, they'll be inf the the, th the width and the height will go to zero, and we'll call them dx's and dy's. And the order, of course, of the multiplication, delta y times delta x, doesn't matter. So we can take the limit as the norm goes to zero for this product as well. And then you do the same thing that you do in Calc 1. You say, well, this we're going to represent this sum. When we let delta x and delta y become infinitely thin, go to zero, in other words, we're going to call delta x and delta y dy and dx. And instead of using the summation notation this way, we'll use 
s for summation here. So we're going to be taking a double sum. And it'll be a double sum of either dx times dy, or it'll be a double sum of dy times dx. And it's customary to call dy dx or dx dy. It's customary to call them da, a change in area. Because you're multiplying a width times a height, you're getting an area. So it's customary to call this da change in area. And so the, the idea is, is once we move to infinitely small delta x's and delta y's by letting the norm go to zero, we need to control the bounds of integration. So we either integrate from here to here, so we're controlling the x's, which means integrate with respect to x first, and let x run from g sub 1 of y, a function, some function of y to another function of y. And then when you integrate with respect to y, say where the y values are running. And I think it's pretty customary to let the y values be named c and d. In this context, they say run the y values from c to d. And then the other possibility is that you are, have a region that you're constraining this way instead. So let's draw a, a diff different region. Let's suppose we have a function here. So we have, let's call this h2 of x. We have some function of x here and some second, some second function of x right here. And we want the area between these two lines, but also between a and b. So we've got vertical lines in here. And then the idea is the same. You still chop the region into infinitely many squares, and the squares are going to have widths delta x and delta y, but we're going to take an appropriate limit so that delta x and delta y both go to zero. We fill the region with infinitely many, infinitely small squares, and then we add up the sum of the, of the products of the delta y's and delta x's. And in this case, we would be doing a dy first, where we would be running the integration in this direction first, controlling the bounds of integration with some function of x, so h1 of x running all the way through h2 of x, and then running in the x direction then from a to b. So this will give you the, er the exact area of the bounded regions. So I summarize that on the next slide. So this is just something that you could put in your notes that's nice. Of course, the assumptions that we make are that our functions are continuous over the region indicated. So here, if we're running from A to B, we need G sub 1 and G sub 2 to be continuous. As we're running from C to D, our functions that are constraining the regions need to be continuous. And over those over those regions. So in the next two videos, we'll do two examples. We'll do the first example will show a calculation of an area of a rectangular region using an iterated in integral. And then we'll uh, show an example in the second video of calculating the area of a region that's bounded by continuous functions over some given inter interval.